As we saw in episode two of this series, the British Army first visited China in 1842. The result was a resounding defeat of the poorly equipped Chinese and the signing of the hugely lopsided Treaty of Nanking, giving the British almost everything they demanded, leaving the Chinese humiliated and resentful. Opium, the drug that was poisoning the Chinese nation, was still being shipped into the ports, gained under the treaty by the shipload. Sooner or later it was bound to end in tears again. Known later as the Arrow Incident, the Second Opium War was seeded by a Chinese boarding of a British flag ship in the port of Canton on the 8th of October 1856 on suspicion of piracy, arresting 12 of its 14 Chinese crew members. In doing so, they tore down the British flag, an insult that the British consul in Canton, Sir Harry Parks, found unacceptable. He demanded the immediate release of all the prisoners and an apology for the insult, and although some of the men were released, no apology was issued. Parks authorised an attack on the city, and the Royal Navy on the 29th of October, under Admiral Sir Michael Seymour, attacked the Chinese fleet at Fat Shun Creek and destroyed four nearby forts. They blasted a hole in the poorly defended city walls, and sailors and marines poured through the breach, but it was a hollow victory as without the forces needed to hold it, the British withdrew to Hong Kong. In London, the government, under the recently re-elected Lord Palmerston, was also insulted by the Arrow incident and other unrest in the Asian outpost, but, far more concerned with potential loss of the opium trade and the huge revenue it brought in, Palmerston dispatched James Bruce, 8th Earl of Elgin, a direct descendant of Robert the Bruce, with a force of 1,700 men. On arriving at Singapore, Elgin received news of the recent uprising in India, covered in episode 10 of this series, and a plea for his troops to be sent to help. Elgin, realising the urgency of the situation, dispatched his troops to India and continued on to China aboard HMS Shannon alone. In Hong Kong, Elgin met with British consuls, Canton's Council Parks and Hong Kong's Council Sir John Bowring, both of whom wanted an immediate attack on Canton, but Elgin, a diplomat and without any troops, opened negotiations with local Chinese authorities in an attempt at a peaceful settlement. The Chinese stalled until Elgin's patience finally ran out in December 1857. Now, having regained his troops, 2,000 from Calcutta and backed by a French force under the command of Baron Jean-Baptiste Louis Gros, the joint commanders sent an ultimatum to the Chinese. Elgin's demands were threefold. Chinese compliance with the Treaty of Nanking, a permanent ambassador in Peking, and finally an apology and reparations for the Arrow incident. The Chinese stalled for time and although the prisoners from the Arrow were released, none of the other demands were met. On the 27th of December, the joint British-French commanders authorised a bombardment of Canton. Within two days, the city had fallen. British killed and wounded totalled about 100, the French just 33. Widespread looting followed, and in a prelude to events later in the conflict, the city was stripped bare. Some 450 Chinese lost their lives. Following the fall of Canton, the Allied force sailed north to the mouth of the Pei Ho, the river that led to the Chinese capital, Peking. More negotiations followed, and the Chinese agreed to some concessions, but they utterly refused to entertain foreign embassies in Peking, a point on which the Allies would not back down on. So, on the 20th of May, 1858, in a show of naval force, the Royal Navy, again under Admiral Sir Michael Seymour, along with their French allies, attacked the Taku forts at the mouth of the river. The Chinese defenders were vastly outgunned by the Navy and fled the forts even before the French ground attack began, but the Allies sustained 88 casualties, of which 11 were killed. With the river undefended, the Allies sent a small force of gunboats up the river towards Peking, and on the 4th of June they reached Tianjin, just 30 miles from the capital. Their unopposed arrival so worried the Emperor that at last he sought peace terms. After much negotiation, the Treaty of Tianjin was signed on the 3rd of July 1858. The British gained 11 extra Chinese ports with which to trade, freedom to travel anywhere in China, 
the opening up of China to Christian missionaries and reparations for the cost of the war. Most importantly, the Chinese agreed to a permanent ambassador in Peking. Nowhere in the treaty was there any mention of the British desire to make the opium trade legal in China. However, in follow-up negotiations it was agreed that a tax of 5% would be levied on all imported goods, including opium, thereby giving the drug de facto legalization. Elgin returned to London, his mission supposedly complete. His brother, Frederick Bruce, was sent to China as the ambassador Elgin had won under the treaty, but in China the arrangements did not go down so well. Although the treaty had been negotiated by the Emperor's delegates, when they returned to the capital he was furious at the terms they had agreed to, having given in to all of the British demands. When Frederick Bruce arrived in China to take up his post as ambassador in mid-June 1859, he found that the Chinese had retaken, rebuilt and strengthened the Taku forts. An attempt under the command of Rear Admiral James Hope to take the forts was a failure, with 500 British casualties. When the news reached London, the government were outraged and vowed revenge by attacking and taking Peking. The Chinese were given time to apologise and to comply with the treaty, but they declined to do so. London dispatched Elgin back to China, arriving in late June of 1860. Ahead of him were 13,000 British troops sent from India under the command of Lieutenant General Sir James Hope Grant. The French had also returned with a smaller force of 6,500. In order to avoid a repeat of the defeat of the previous year, Grant landed 10 miles north of the forts and advanced to the south. On the 21st of August 1860, the Allies attacked. The major assault taking place on the main Chinese fort, attacking in two columns, one British and one French. Attempts to cross the main gate failed and the main attack was made against the walls using ladders, the French gaining entry first. Resistance continued inside the fort for three and a half hours before the fort was finally cleared of defenders. The British suffered 60 casualties of whom 14 men were killed. A second fort was then attacked but little resistance was put up and it was quickly taken. As a result, the last two forts were untenable and surrendered. The river route to Peking was now open. The Chinese authorities capitulated all 22 forts along the river as far as Tianjin. With the Allies at Tianjin, negotiations were started with the Chinese, but under a flag of truce, the British negotiators were taken prisoner and later tortured, with some of their escort killed. Negotiations ceased, and the army advanced from Tianjin with a cavalry screen meeting a large Chinese army with a five-mile front. There was a skirmish between cavalry, then with the Allied artillery, silencing the Chinese artillery. The Chinese army scattered and retreated. Two days later, on the 20th of September, the cavalry discovered the Chinese army in a strong position in front of a canal connecting Peking with the river with two bridges behind them. The Allied army attacked frontally and the cavalry attacked from the left, forcing the Chinese back over the bridges. The Anglo-French force inflicted massive losses on the Chinese army trapped by the canal. The Emperor fled the capital, leaving his brother to be in charge of negotiations, which centred on the release of the prisoners. The talks failed and on the 11th of October, engineers threw up works and batteries to break through the walls of Peking. Everything was ready that evening when at 11.30pm the gate opened and the city surrendered. The Anglo-French forces entered Peking and sacked both the Summer Palace and the Old Summer Palace. Thousands of priceless treasures and artefacts were stolen or destroyed. Elgin wanted to destroy the palaces as punishment for the murdered negotiators, but was dissuaded from doing so by Baron Gros. He settled on burning them instead. The Chinese, defeated, had no option but to sign yet another lopsided treaty, and at the Convention of Peking on the 18th of October 1860, the Second Opium War was brought to an end. Among the terms in the treaty, the Chinese agreed to sign the Treaty of Tianjin and open Tianjin as a trade port, cede the district of Kowloon to Britain, allow freedom of religion to be established in China, and worst of all, legalize the opium trade. 
Britain once again had bullied its way over the Chinese nation, but victory was not altogether welcomed at home, with many people and organisations against the trade. But the massive profits to be gained by drug trading on an international scale ensured that the trade would continue for many years to come. By the early 1900s, however, domestic production of opium by Chinese farmers had virtually stripped Britain of its income, and various attempts by Chinese authorities to ban the trade were no longer resisted by London. And in 1907, Great Britain signed a treaty agreeing to gradually eliminate opium exports to China over the next decade. Chinese reliance on opium continued on with various attempts to wean the nation off the drug, failing until the 1950s when the communist government of Mao Zedong took a dictatorial approach and finished the trade for good. Ten million addicts were forced into compulsory treatment, dealers were executed and opium producing regions were planted with new crops and after 150 years of devastating addiction the Chinese nation was finally free of its terrible grip. The Second Opium War lasted just over four years and caused about a thousand Allied casualties. The Second China War Medal was issued by the British government on the 6th of March 1861 for those members of the British Army and Royal Navy who took part in the conflict. Its appearance is almost identical to its predecessor issued for the First War, but with one important detail. The obverse depicts the crown head of Queen Victoria facing left, with the legend Victoria Regina around the rim. The reverse has a shield bearing the royal arms, with a palm tree and trophy of arms behind, with the inscription Armis Exposia Pacem above, and the word China in the exerg below. It's in the exerg that the difference to the first medal can be found. Notice the removal of the previous date. The medal is suspended from its ribbon by a horn-shaped suspender, identical to the one used on the Indian Mutiny Medal, issued just three years earlier with its higher-than-normal claw, giving the whole medal a slightly elongated look. The officially adopted ribbon is crimson with yellow edges, the crimson representing the heraldic colour of Great Britain and the yellow the imperial colour of China. An alternative ribbon can sometimes be found on some medals that is five equally spaced stripes coloured blue, yellow, red, white and green, representing the colours of the Xing Dynasty flag. This style of ribbon was proposed but not finally officially used. Medals issued to the Navy were usually unnamed, but those issued to the Army were indented with the recipient's name, rank and unit around the rim. Six clasps were authorised for the Second China War Medal. Again, similar in design to the recent Mutiny Medal, fishtailed with roses. The first clasp for China 1842 was awarded to any serviceman that was due the Second China War Medal and that had already served in and been awarded a medal for the First China War. Only 93 of these bars were issued. The second clasp, that of Fat Shan 1857, was awarded to naval and marine personnel who took part in the Battle of Fat Shan Creek on the 1st of June in the lead up to the Battle for Canton. The third clasp is that for Canton 1857 issued to Army and Naval servicemen present for the Battle of Canton from 28th of December 1857 to 5th of January 1858. The fourth clasp and the first for the fighting around the Taku Forts is that of Taku Forts 1858. It was issued to naval personnel who were serving aboard specified ships during the first successful attempt to take the forts under the command of Rear Admiral Michael Seymour on the 20th of May 1858. The fifth clasp for Taku 1860 is for the third successful attempt to retake the forts, returned after the Treaty of Tianjin under the command of Lieutenant General Sir James Hope Grant in August 1860. No bar was issued for the unsuccessful second attempt in 1859, despite the high casualty rate. The last clasp, authorised for the second China medal, was for Peking 1860. This bar was awarded to all troops present at the final battle and defeat of that city in September and October of 1860. The medal could also be awarded without a clasp for those present, but not involved with any of the major battles. The medal shown here, 
was awarded to Gunner John Phelan of the Royal Artillery. Born in Ireland in 1835, John signed up for the 65th Regiment of Foot in February 1854, aged 19. Transferring to the Royal Artillery in September, he went on to serve a total of 17 years with 12 years posted overseas, including India, Abyssinia, Crimea and of course China. During his service, he is noted as having been in the Regimental Defaulters book a total of 23 times and three times tried by courts martial being found guilty and imprisoned each time. Despite this, his discharge papers, signed in May 1872, describe his conduct to have been good, having earned two good conduct badges. Along with his second China War Medal, he was also awarded campaign medals for the Abyssinian War in 1869 and the Crimean War in 1854, with a class for Sebastopol. Join us again next time when we travel even further from home to visit the land of the Long White Cloud, New Zealand.